Turning to you from uh, from College Station, Texas, I'm sitting in my in my actually my kitchen <laughs> uh, dining area table and talking to my computer. And I, so, of course, I have no absolutely no feedback. I can't see anybody either. I'm not even getting any video, so I'm not sure uh, how well this is going to come across. We'll just have to see. I'll I'll go through what I've got for you. And then uh, we were going to try and do some kind of Q&A, and I'm not sure how that's going to play out uh, until or unless I can figure out some way to have a little better communications. The world has changed. I, I, all bets are off. That's the, that's the subtitle of the, of the presentation. It was interesting if you saw uh, the president's uh, press conference about, a, oh, several days ago, I think it was last Thursday, one of the uh, one of the reporters asked him what his economists and what his economic advisors were uh, advising him about what the economy was going to do and so on. And his response was the exact correct response: They don't have a clue. They don't really. We don't know. We we have to throw out our textbooks. There are no models for this. Everything is going different. Uh, we're just not sure where we're going with all of this. So how bad is it? And the buzzword of the day among the economists is that, well, it's going to be yet, but it's going to be the worst on record. We're we're moving in that direction. March was not that bad, but not that good either. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get further down the line, and we start getting some April uh, data in, and particularly when we get on down to May. We're going to start seeing some some numbers that are going to look really horrible by historical standards. Uh, claims uh, everybody's been seeing that on the on the news and so forth uh, up through last week uh, or to the 18th, I should say. Uh, we don't have last week up to over 26 and a half million, almost 17 percent. Unemployment rate is probably running somewhere around 16, 17, 18 percent. It won't be. We started with 4 percent. If, if you have 17 percent of the jobs, it's not an additive factor exactly because of the uh, change in definition of labor force and so forth. So look, best guess. And that's the reason for that little squiggly mark. It means approximately or maybe or my best guess. <laughs> That, that we're probably somewhere around 17, 18%. Texas unemployment, we've been actually doing better. Uh, you can see it was about 17% of the jobs, uh, uh, roughly in terms of unemployment claims, we're running about 8%. Our unemployment rate has probably jumped from about 4%. Uh, I've even seen some estimates as low as nine for the current, uh, but we're approaching a double digit unemployment rate. We're gonna, we're gonna probably, before this is all over, and sometime during this second quarter of the year, we're going to probably reach those levels that we did here in Texas back in the uh, late 80s uh, during the recession and the oil and gas bus of the late 80s. March uh, housing starts. Uh, we're down about 22 percent month over month. They were actually still positive on a year over year. Uh, you got to remember that the, the pandemic really didn't start taking effect until roughly the middle of the month, and some of the uh, downturn didn't start for a week or so after that. So starts and permits, obviously from February to March, fell off pretty good. But on a year-over-year -year basis, we were still we were still doing pretty well. The Dallas-Fort Worth area was still doing well in terms of new home starts and permits being permitted. <laughs> Home sales in the same fashion, uh, home sales at the statewide level on a year over year basis, we're, we're up about one and a half percent. Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, according to our data, was about flat in terms of sales. March kind of leveled out. Median prices were up. Uh, they were all up uh, at the state level. They were up at the local level there in the Dallas Fort Worth area. But one of the things we've been watching, and we're watching even for the March data, the, the active listings. Uh, people are not going to be and are not be, are not listing their properties as active. Uh, there's even some uh, anecdotal evidence uh, from reports from realtors 
that a lot of sellers are looking around and saying, hey, uh, I think I'm going to take my property off the market unless they just have to sell. And uh, because I really don't want people coming into the house, we're, we're supposed to be self quarantined. Uh, buyers are reluctant to go and look at houses. It's still happening. And there's there are some house showings going on. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, virtual showings with uh, uh, virtual tours of houses and so forth. So it hasn't gone completely uh, down. The double whammy, of course, that Texas is getting hit with is the oil price. And as most of you probably are well aware, it's now down less than $10 a barrel uh, or in that $10 barrel uh, range. It keeps moving around so much day to day. Uh, we, I read a report just this morning that the uh, that there are some major players that are going to sell their June futures uh, oil price uh, contracts, which could lead to another day or two where oil prices will fall into the negative category, where basically the producers uh, are having to pay people not uh, to to do anything. There's about uh, 3.6. Actually, that data that number just got updated this morning to about four million mortgages. In, in forbearance, it's a little better than 7% of total, uh, and it's a little bit better than actually FHA uh, is now running about 10% uh, of forbearance. And we're going to have to just see. So this is these are some of the data points. Uh, most of you are probably following the news, and you're hearing all kinds of different things. These are just some that I pulled out. I'm going to go through a few slides here pretty quickly. You can see for yourself uh, U.S. non-farm employment on a change per month. Again, remember this was March before a lot of these unemployment claims hit. So officially for March, we lost 700,000 uh, jobs. But but the way the data are collected by, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, it really only reflected the change through about the middle of the March, about March 12th. So it didn't pick up a lot. Here's, here's what these unemployment claims look like. We're looking at almost 26 and a half million claims in the space of a month. Almost 26 and a half million people who were working uh, filed, uh, filed for uninsurance, uh, uh, unemployment insurance uh, along. And incidentally, these people are also expecting to get not only their un unemployment insurance, but they're expecting to get the $600 add-on uh, from the federal government, this part of the CARES program and so forth. I gave you the March 7th and March 14th numbers, just so you can kind of see, and you can see the black, the little black bars there, shows you that on a week, on a week to week, week basis, uh, it, the unemployment claims are really fairly steady. And, and, to, and to be into the millions uh, in excess of 5 million uh, claims in the course of one week, is just extraordinary. I mean, it's just absolutely mind boggling. And, and we don't really know what to make of it. We don't know exactly uh, how this is going to play out. Uh, I suspect I'm sure all of you have as good a guess on some of this stuff as I do, which incidentally for most economists right now, that's all we're doing. <laughs> uh, but, but the best guess is that, you know, or the, the worry, the concern is, Will these 26 and a half million jobs be available later on in a month or two or three from now for people to go back and and go back to work and and take their jobs back and go back on the regular payroll? As you well know, with some of the the one the people that have been hit the hardest are service employees, hospitality and leisure. We're reading about it and seeing it on the news all the time about restaurant workers. Uh, workers at hotels and motels and so forth, uh, people in the services, generally lower paying jobs on a per hour basis. And quite frankly, some of them are probably doing better doing unemployment with the extra 600 bucks. 600 bucks a week is a 40 hour week at $15 an hour equivalent. So, so uh, some of them are gonna do a lot better uh, on that. Consumer Opti, this is one where we do, came out this morning as a matter of fact, so I updated this one for you. And you can see over there on the far right, the, the very the, the dramatic uh, drop off. I mean, since January, consumer optimism and confidence is is down about 33 percent, down a third. Uh, we were running along pretty close, you know, there uh, consistently for almost a year at around that 130 mark. That's just an index number. 
is just to give you a relative uh, idea. Uh, consumer confidence is extremely important, and quite frankly, this is one of those measures we're watching very closely because when I get later on, we'll talk about what it's going to take to recover from all of this. And one of the things, one of the key things, maybe the key thing that's going to be important uh, is going to be consumerism, uh, people spending money, which leads us to, uh, if you're familiar with the way these data are collected, they actually measure three or four, five, actually about six different uh, measures. The consumer confidence index is typically reported as a overall index uh, that goes on and, and is an overall look thing on expectations. And it was interesting to note that then the April expectations uh, actually rose. The, the, the curve actually bumped up a little bit so it's good news that that consumers, at least the ones being uh, surveyed, were saying that they do expect the next six months, uh, that they are a little more optimistic about consumerism and spending money uh, than the immediate current consumer confidence uh, is. And in fact, basically, the consumer confidence index of 93.8 was more or less not much different than what it was last October. And incidentally, that was a, a pretty good reading uh, last October. So you get an idea that maybe on a little bit long-term outlook, out, outlook of several months on down the line, I know all of us are, are doing that. We're, we're trying to think about, all right, I understand where we are today and April has been really a miserable month and May is, I'm gonna tell you right now, May is gonna be even worse in terms of statistics, the, the statistics that we're going to be looking at. But uh, but on down the line, we're, we are expecting to, and the, and the general expectation, I think, is we're going to get out of this and we're going to get beyond it somewhere down the line. Uh, retail sales, here's the consumer, here's the, here's the immediate proof of what that consumer confidence drop in consumer confidence looks like. We're in, a, in the month, and this was month of March, so we don't have the April data yet. Uh, you can see that retail sales just simply fell off the table uh, relative to what they look like. I gave you several years back history, just so you can see kind of how it bangs around. Even back in 07, 08, and 09, uh, back over there to the left, you can see it dipped down almost 4%. And we thought that was uh, a real dramatic, uh, almost unprecedented decline in retail sales at the time during the financial crisis and the Great Recession nothing compared to what's going on today we've never had the economic shutdown of the country before i mean what we've got is a government mandated shutdown of the economy and our and and everything else and so it's not to be unexpected that all of these data all of the statistics are just going to go to the floor uh, because uh, the the pace of our economy was was uh, was just simply mandated to to almost stop. Now, obviously, there's still a lot of things going on. All the essential services. There's still people buying things, for example, online from Amazon. People are still going to grocery stores. Still got to eat. But the the relative level of of what's going on has been slowed down completely. Optimism or the expectations, if you will, by small businesses, Main Street. You would expect this to be. In fact, I I'm suggesting. This is going to go even lower. Uh, I know that there's the PPP, the payroll protection program going on and small business loans. Uh, nearly seven seven hundred billion dollars have been allocated in the two different acts by Congress to uh, try to help on small businesses. Uh, but you can see that the uh, the optimism, the outlook, uh, if you will, by by small business owners, at least in the survey, uh, fell greatly in March, and this, like I say, this is going to go even deeper here, probably in May and, and uh, April and May, when we get the get the final readings in uh, from what they what they feel. It, it's no secret that there are literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of small businesses that basically have been through no fault of their own, basically been ordered to shut down shut their doors, stop business, uh, cease activities. And even those who 
are able to do like a restaurant that can do a drive through business or, a, or that kind of thing. It's a, it's such a small percentage of their, their, what they expect to do that, uh, that a lot of these are not going to come, come back probably. I know all interested in interest rates and, and interest rates are going to be uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, the capital markets are, are in a great bit, uh, great deal of, of, uh, uncertainty right now the level of debt at corporate level uh particularly uh the bwa uh, rated and below uh, the junk bond market the fed has stepped in within the last week to try and buoy, buoy that market up to stop any type of uh of snowball effect uh, from the from the uh, corporate bond market going into problems uh, the Fed has actually done a pretty good job and is doing a good job of, of the best they can uh, to keep the capital market uh, flowing and in order. What you see there, the green line is the uh, federal funds rate. That's the, the overnight bank lending rate. That's the one you hear about uh, all the time when the FOMC meets. Uh, it is still going to stay. It's, it doesn't go down exactly to zero. Technically, they set the range from zero to 0.5%. Uh, so we just measure it and call the effective rate 0 0.25. Uh, but, but for all intent and purposes, that's a 0% rate. The 10-year treasury, though, you can see has fallen off a cliff, has come down, is approaching that. And in fact, on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, has actually hit the 0.5% level. Uh, that's an extraordinary uh, low 10-year treasury rate. It's still better than most of the foreign rates because most of the foreign countries are uh, even less than that, and quite a few of them, like Germany and France and Italy, are negative, and Japan are negative 10-year uh, rates. Uh, uh, Britain is right close to zero. It's almost like our Fed fund rate. The 30-year fixed mortgage rate, interestingly, and many of you will be familiar with this, uh, has not come down as much, and this, these are these are monthly numbers, so they don't look quite as low. I'm, I'm aware that the the current rate around the country is still is running around 3.3, and a little lower. Now that's for 30 year fixed rate, 20 uh, percent down. So I mean, obviously the term and conditions can change, and so forth. I'm uh, aware that you can get less than three if you have an outstanding FICA score down payment and go for 15 year. Term, but uh, nevertheless, that 30-year rate has, has been uh, it's been sticky downward is a, is the way we generally phrase that. One of the reasons for that, and one of the primary reasons for that, is that the mortgage industry simply lacks the capacity to be able to handle the demand that has hit their offices all of a sudden for refinances. The refi market has hit very hard. It was up almost 107 percent last month. Even though the purchase mortgage market, the, the, the demand and market for new loans to be made has actually declined about 25%. So it's interesting, uh, the, the lenders are, are not uh, anxious to lower the rates and encourage even more uh, people to come in because they quite frankly just can't handle the business and they don't know exactly where it's all going anyway. Uh, so we'll have to see. Here's a, here's a slide that I found for you. This is from the International Monetary Fund that takes a global perspective uh, on the economy and where they think things are going. And this is important because, as you well know, Texas is being hit with the double whammy, not only the shutdown from the coronavirus and COVID-19, but of course, oil prices. And the oil, the energy market is still a significant player in the overall Texas economy and, and where we're going to be going in the future. The reason the oil market is so soft and is going to stay so soft is because of all of these, especially down there on the bottom panel, the emerging markets are not growing or grow, even some are declining and going actually into negative territory, uh, such as Russia, although they produce their own oil. Uh, but you're seeing China and India and so forth when those countries don't grow, they don't grow their demand for oil, and that has hurt the demand side of the equation. At the same time, supply has been coming up so much. But what you see here is for the year of 2020. This is for the full year. 
that they're estimating uh, the, the global economy is going to shrink by 3%, uh, U.S. down about 6%, uh, Germany at 7 France or negative 7 uh, France at negative 7 2 Italy at 9% down, uh, United Kingdom at 6.5% negative. Nobody's positive. Uh, what's going to happen, the best guess is second quarter of of this year is the is the killer now incidentally if you see over there in the right hand column the projection is though for recovery in 2021 uh, that that there's the dip here in the and i'll tell you but in the second and third quarter of this year by fourth quarter of this year and then on into first and second and third fourth quarter of 2021 the expectations are there will be recovery there will be generally positive growth but I can tell you, for example, if U.S. goes down 6% and comes back 47 the next year, you're still not back up to where you were uh, because of the way that the percentages work. Here's, uh, I found this for you. This is a, a summary of a whole bunch of different folks from Bank of America and Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Bloomberg and so forth with their the various estimates of what's going to happen here in the April, May, June time slot, the second quarter of this year. First quarter, uh, most uh, we still don't have first quarter official numbers from BEA, but but uh, first quarter is going to be plus or minus zero. I mean, it's going to be, it could be a slight positive. It might even be a slight negative. It's a matter of how much impact the second half of March played on the whole first quarter. You got to remember January and February, we started out the year in good shape, even into the first week or two of March. So most of the first quarter was not too bad. It was probably growing at long if we'd, if you'd extended it out, looking like the economy was going to go to about, oh, a 2%, 2.1% growth rate for the quarter. We don't know. It probably is going to be less than that. I'm guessing it's going to be around 1%, but it'll still be slightly positive. What this is showing is that all the so-called experts know. <laughs> you can see that just from the range of expectations. They're central. They're they're focusing in that mid 30s average is around 30% uh, decline uh, for the second quarter, decline from the first quarter. Uh, Fred uh, over there on the left. That's the St. Louis. Federal Reserve, they, they are one of the better uh, sources of data on the economy and so forth. And that's just uh, the, low, the the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. They, they came out with a projection of minus 15.3%. I don't think the, 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 the Federal Reserve has been hesitant to put out too many reports. I also found, here's a survey by the Wall Street Journal, where they surveyed more than 60 economists around the country. If they survey 60 economists and they all say the same thing, we're in trouble. They're probably all wrong. But you can see that uh, they expected the first quarter GDP for, for the first quarter this year to be negative 3%. I don't think it'll be that bad. Could be, but but I don't think so. It's That's all a guess right now. But they are, even they averaged out at about a negative 25% for the second quarter. But look at what they've got for the third quarter. That's where a lot of the uncertainty is. That's the recovery quarter. Is it going to be the first quarter of recovery? Is it not going to be? Is it going to continue to be negative? Or could it be have a big bounce back? The 55% up is probably way too optimistic. Uh, it averaged about 6%. Uh, we'd be really, really good if we could get 6% positive on third quarter. It would still be negative for the year because of 25% drop in second quarter. But at least we'd be headed more in the in the same direction. June price of oil, uh, as of this morning, all of, all bets are off on the June price of oil. Uh, these are monthly numbers, not daily, not weekly. So on a daily, weekly basis, you're going to see some bad news coming back out. I would not be surprised if again we see uh, on a daily basis uh, price of oil go drop down to in negative territory. Uh, where producers are having to pay somebody to take the oil from them, but but that's that evens out, and it's a function of non-delivery on the on the futures markets. Jobs, uh, twenty twenty for the year, and this is a critical number. Uh, and here, 
change was from a positive half a million to 2.7 million still on the negative side. That one's going to be really critical. That and the consumer spending. In fact, you're going to hear me say that about five or six times. Uh, in terms of our, our economic outlook here of where it's going. And at this moment, it's all hinging quite, quite frankly on what happens during the third and fourth quarters of the year, of this year, of, of just all those 26 and a half million jobs where unemployment has been filed. And incidentally, that 20 is probably going to jump up, you know, be close to 30 million here when we get next uh, last week's numbers. Uh, it, it, it's, going to, it's going to be a function of, of as we reopen the economy and as we, we phase in uh, the, the reopening of the economy and, and businesses opening back up, how rapidly and to what extent some of these jobs that have been furloughed uh, versus layoffs, uh, et cetera, are going to be recaptured back into the market. Home prices, we'll be lucky to have uh, about, a, about a one to 2% increase. And you can see the range there. There was a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, the, the housing market, quite frankly, though, has, has the potential uh, to do even better than that, we'll have to see. I don't think prices what might get hit as hard uh, uh, in terms of percent increases like we've seen the last several years. Uh, the activity there in the housing market, both in, in the price level of existing homes as well as for new housing, has some, uh, some uh, potential. CPI inflation. Probably going to run, and, and here's a big danger point. Everybody is really, really worried about this of, of having a depression. A depression means that you have disinflation uh, or deflation. So you instead of having prices going up, you actually have prices coming down. If we start seeing a great deal of prices coming down and going negative, and particularly for things like real estate and value of businesses, value of land. Uh, and other uh, commodities, particularly fixed assets, that is a real danger uh, sign and something for you to really pay attention to. The June number might be negative, uh, or at least maybe the first half of the year, but we'll have to see how the rest. Uh, the probability of recession, we're in a recession, guys. We're in a, we're in a mandated recession. The government had just said, okay, everybody go home, stop, shelter in place and so forth, basically has created a recession uh, when you have negative GDP growth, when you have the kinds of declines that I was showing you in some of those slides, no, no doubt about it. What does it look like to recover? I'm, I've said it two or three times. I'm going to hit it and I highlighted the, the line. Jobs and spending is going to be the pace of recovery, and it's going to happen as we're hearing on the news every day now and, and how it's going. It's going to be in stages or in phases. I've labeled these as short-term, medium-term, and long-run. Uh, short-term, next two to six months, that's what I'm talking about. The rest of this quarter and on in through the third quarter of this year. And then the medium-term, six, six to 12 months. And then the long-run, and it, we can get into a lot of discussion about what we think the long-run might look like, but one to two years out. There was a report out this morning uh, from a, a noted economist in Europe, out of England, uh, who is projecting that Europe is going to uh, uh, require at least two years to completely recover from all of this. To completely recover, whatever that really means, uh, yeah, probably is a, is a year to two years uh, down the road, even for the U.S., we don't know whether uh, V-shaped, U-shaped, L-shaped, W-shaped. The W-shaped recovery is if we have uh, a recurrence of a high incidence of uh, caseloads and deaths picked back up, and then we all shut back down again and go back into uh, self-quarantine uh, or, or stay at home and, and come back out and so forth. The thing I'd point out to you, I mean, if we have a 33% decline in our economy, You've got to have at least a 50% plus recovery after that to just come back to break even. You got to remember the way that the laws of arithmetic and percentage changes work. So uh, if we, it, whatever is going to, how, however bad this gets, however far far we fall, uh, the the amount of recovery 
has to be very significant to get us back. For those of you who've been watching your 401ks and your stock investments and so forth, uh, you're probably down somewhere in that 20 to 30% uh, uh, thing. And for your for your uh, stock portfolio to come back, think about what, what the prices are gonna have to do to come back to just get you back to where you were. Uh, we've all been through that uh, for those of us with any age on us, we back in 2001 and again in 2008. Job recovery, and this is uh, this is U.S. This is Texas, as you know. All the states are doing different. I'll get to Texas here in a second. Job recovery by industry segments is going to be uneven. Some are going to come back, uh, obviously, a lot faster than others. Uh, uh, the services industries. Uh, the major services industries, insurance and so forth, will come back okay. In fact, many of them didn't fall that much because you can do that kind of work at home. Um, and, and a lot of the uh, online uh, activity that's been going on. But others, like the hotel and motel, the uh, restaurants and so forth, movie theaters, uh, any type of athletic uh, things. Uh, I was looking this morning, the NFL can't figure out what they're and and rightly so, they don't know. I can tell you, I'm here at Texas A and M. The the university said yesterday, uh, the the high high poobahs of the university here still are not sure exactly how the fall term is, what it's going to look like, uh, if it's going to start on time, and to what extent it will be sort of uh, business as usual or now business as unusual uh, for this fall. So it's, it's going to be very segmented. It's going to be very uneven. And we're going to keep hearing stories about the, the particularly those industry groups and segments that have the most trouble getting, uh, getting recovered. Housing could be a leader. The, the low interest rates we were talking about, uh, the, the fact that construction can still continue and, in fact, is, has been all along an essential service, an essential business uh, that did not require uh, their employees and their their workers to have to stay at home. Uh, the other side of that, of course, is we're going to see most, and that's housing that, that could do that. Uh, the commercial real estate, most of the projects that uh, and I'm talking to a lot of people, projects that were already underway probably will get finished because there's nothing more worthless than a half-built building. Uh, but But it's tough if you finish the building and you don't have any tenants. That's also difficult. So a lot of those that were already under construction and already under development, at, and, and particularly if it was more than 50% or so, uh, they're gonna probably go ahead and be finished. Uh, several of the developers I've talked to though said all of their plans and all of the developments and pro properties and projects that they had planned for the rest of this year and even on into next year are all now frozen on hold. Uh, they're gonna have to wait and see how the market uh, reacts and what happens. Uh, over time here to, to find out. And also the financing is gonna be an issue and that's gonna become an issue in the housing market as well. Let me let me direct our attention here to Texas specifically. It's really too soon to really know or tell about our future. We know that the governor has come out and said that I think it's by this Friday, we're gonna, we're gonna start reopening in, in phases. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna let some businesses come back and some not. And, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I really do need desperately to get a haircut. I've even let my wife have access to my hair yet, and that was that was a, a big concession. So we'll have to see what's going on. Texas, we've been extremely fortunate. Uh, been extremely fortunate. U.S. Uh, on par with Germany. We've done much better than other countries. Uh, we have one of the lowest death rates per million uh, as a country. And te Texas within the United States, We again, we've been very fortunate that to date, uh, we have been hit relatively mildly relative to our population and our size. And the fact that we have two uh, major metropolitan areas, you know, number four and five in the country in Dallas and, and Houston, uh, and and the caseload, these are these numbers are dated. I'm I'm not going to bother you with them. Uh, you can look them up; they're online. Uh, but we're 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 we went very far down the list in terms of the number of cases per million population, and very far down in deaths. And and it's hard to talk about deaths because 
anybody who who has died from this or if you know somebody you have friends it's it it comes close to home but from a from a aggregate level uh for example louisiana we it was hit very hard in new york city we all know about uh so we have to we have to look at the fact and that's one of the reasons i'm pretty sure the governor is trying to get our economy back up and so forth uh that we haven't been hit quite as hard as some of the other places we have a lot of uh, open area. We have a lot of towns and communities of smaller population base, less than 30,000 and so forth around the state where uh, it, the incidence rate is extremely low. And and uh, people would, I think they're getting, everybody's getting a little stir crazy. They're ready to get out of the house and, and move around and do things. Here's what Texas looks like. We've had a little over a million, we've had almost a million 700,000 claims on the on the unemployment insurance. Uh, March officially, we lost 50,900 jobs and unemployment rate uh, increased from a little less than 4% up to 4.7. That's obviously gonna change when we see the April numbers. The April numbers are gonna be uh, uh, very much higher than this, about 10%, 10, 11% of the jobs, uh, people working rather, uh, have filed for unemployment. Uh, we're gonna see an unemployment rate at the state level uh, probably in that neighborhood of double digits, uh, close to 10% uh, by the time it's all said and done. And, and again, there's still a couple of three weeks, probably more of, a, of higher filings. It'll be interesting to see if we can get that graphic to come down. The Dallas Fed, of course, puts out a, uh, a uh, leading economic index. Uh, their March was way down. April is going to be down even lower. It was down 12% in one month. Don't be surprised, and uh, we'll update this. I think it's the next few days they come out with the numbers. Uh, we'll see that, that I'm sure it'll it'll drop even further. You can see what it looked like back during the Great Recession, back there in 08, 09. Uh, even the oil bust that we had during uh, from uh, late 2014 through 2016, uh, how this leading index shows us uh, kind of what our economy is doing. The next shaded area will be here in, in the 2020 uh, 20 area uh, when we get to it. On down, these are these are weekly prices, so you don't show, see that negative number. It's going to be on down. I'm uh, the the weekly numbers uh, for later on. I, I just pointed out the lowest that was back on March 27th. It actually bounced back up a little bit after that. And we'll have to see the rig count is going to come down considerably. Uh, I'm not going to be surprised if you see that low point down there of 173 active rigs back in 2016. Uh, we're probably headed back into that territory uh, for rigs. There's just no there's just no demand right now to produce any more oil. In fact, the the market is produced less. There will still be rigs uh, drilled uh, and active uh, drilling uh, wells, uh, mainly because of the business. Uh, climate to maintain leases uh, to keep some staff online so that people don't have to be laid off and so forth. But this is uh, this is not boding well uh, for the the Texas market uh, in general, but particularly for those uh, areas that are more oil and gas uh, dependent. Dallas Fort Worth, for example, in the 2016 period, you guys you didn't feel it. I mean, Dallas-Fort Worth uh, blew right on through that oil price decline and the rig collapse there back from 2014 to 2016. Uh, did the same thing, San Antonio for the most part. Houston, of course, got hit. Uh, and some of the other uh, communities that are far more oil and gas related. So we're suspecting that that, that same situation will hold, uh, uh, that Houston will be hit a lot harder than Dallas. Uh, I was talking to the uh, some folks out in the Odessa yesterday. Uh, yeah, they're <laughs> they're 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 down. They, they it's interesting. They weren't as down as I thought they'd be, especially in attitude and expectations for the future, which bodes well. <clears throat> Excuse me, that they are not expecting uh, uh, the total collapse to 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 maintain that long. They're just waiting. Once we can turn the economy around and get people back out and doing things and businesses back out and doing things, the demand for oil should come back at least to some level. And of course, globally, that would be true too. But here's, for example, U.S. implied demand for gas. 
I don't know how you are, but I haven't filled up my truck here in about three or four weeks. So I'm not gas because I'm not going anywhere, not doing much of anything. So uh, I think we go up to the, we, we go and pick up some pharmacies and go to the grocery store and pick up at curbside delivery. And that's about it. So uh, the the demand for gasoline and so is just falling off the, the, falling off the cliff. We're going to have the stage or phased reopening of the economy, as the governor has pointed out, and and correctly. I, there, this was not that you just overnight just declare, okay, everybody go back and do what you were doing before. It isn't going to work that way. It isn't going to work that easily. Uh, the the healthcare professionals, of course, are telling us they're they're real worried about even even limited reopenings and people back together could result in in some type of uh, second wave uh, or second peak in the way uh, of number of cases and so forth uh, it's probably to predict that with accuracy but it's a it's a reasonable expectation on the other hand as we pointed out if the if the incidence rate is it's a cost benefit balancing act and and trying to reopen the economy because we don't want to just put people every everybody in the poorhouse or bankrupt and trying to do it key job recovery people being brought back to their jobs or perhaps new jobs being created uh we're going to have to see how that plays out and it's more of a timing it's it's a matter of when these jobs and and to what level these jobs are going to come back and or how long this the, we're going to stay in the hole and and come back the expectation best expectation to u shaped recovery i don't think it'll be a v i don't think it'll be an l but for those of you who like the alphabet soup but it will be something of a u and i just don't know how how wide that u is going to be we'll have to see the second thing and we've said it i've said it before the consumer attitudes and spending uh, as people do go back to work, as they get back on the payrolls and so forth, and I'm talking about people now who've been laid off, furloughed, whatnot, and taken off the, pay, the, the 26 and a half million or nearly 30 million people that'll probably be there, uh, how, what their attitude about spending their money is going to be, what they're gonna spend it on and, and how quickly. We're gonna have to put businesses back in business and, and the, the big debate now or the big uncertainty and it's 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 going to be an inevitable fallout. There are going to be businesses that are not going to reopen. There are businesses that are going to wind up declaring bankruptcy. As you know, right now we're in a moratorium. Mortgage payments, debt payments, even for bankruptcy. So we don't see it yet. It's going to be six months, three to six months before we start seeing how this plays out. Uh, but a number, particularly small businesses, the, the mom and pa shops who just don't have the capital uh, resources to, to cover this kind of a downturn. But maybe there'll be more resiliency, but that, that'll be interesting. The energy market is going to be decimated. It's not going to be the same. We're going to have to see from a state basis, from looking at the oil and gas industries, they're going to be different. We're expecting uh, a lot of the energy, the independent producers, uh, the, the marginal producers are, are almost doomed uh, in terms of being able to weather the effect. Most of them are highly levered, uh, can't handle the debt load and, and are just not going to be the same. Uh, there's going to be consolidation. Uh, I think on the go forward basis, whereas in Texas we had nearly about 400 uh, independent producers and so forth, that number is going to be drastically reduced. We'll have to see. Housing, we're expecting it to rebound reasonably well. And incidentally, probably in, in, a, in a pretty reasonable time fashion. Now that's uh, being optimistic. I can tell you right now that for the next couple of months, uh, probably through the end of the second quarter, home sales, uh, don't be surprised at all to see double digit uh percentage declines maybe double digit declines into the 20 percents 20 uh percents not the tens but the 20s uh month to month basis there's going to be a hit into the housing market 
but we're suspecting that during all of this, uh, there is going to be some pent up demand uh, by apartment dwellers, tenants, uh, renters who are gonna want to go and buy a house, people who were going to buy a house and trying to move up or move over, uh, who put their plans on hold. And, and uh, as this market comes back, and it may be a slow coming back, it may take anywhere from three to six to nine months for that to happen, but some of that demand will start breaking through and and uh, showing up back into the marketplace. Home building, uh, the home builders are gonna be probably hesitant at first to build too many spec homes, although we're hearing reports from the realtors that buyers are are not, a, not averse as averse to going in and physically uh, examining and touring a newly built home that's never been lived in, of course, a new home, as opposed to going and, and, and looking at an existing home. So maybe there'll be, and the, and the home builders are more and more trying to target that affordability, the workforce housing. Uh, here in Texas, uh, the under 300,000 or under 325,000 market, uh, uh, and we should see that rebound uh, come along reasonably well. And I've got if with a lot of dots, there's, there's a lot of things that have to happen there. One of the things that's gonna have to happen is mortgage money is gonna have to kind of loosen up because right now I can tell you what happened right after the uh, uh, great recession in 08, 09, if you all remember, uh, you had Dodd-Frank, you had all of the regulators going in on all the lenders, particularly the real estate lender, call, you know, very high risk loans. So what they did and what we're gonna see here probably for the next six to nine to 12 months is we're gonna see all of the mortgage lenders go back to making the quote unquote vanilla loans. Uh, you're, you're already seeing it. JP Morgan came out and said, hey, we don't want any client, we're not gonna make any home loans for anybody under 700 uh, FICA score and without a 20% down payment. And other lenders, uh, originators are coming up and, and, and making it just difficult. I know the GSEs and FHA and, and, F and HUD are trying their best to, to loosen uh, the terms and make, make mortgage credit uh, easier to obtain, but the lenders are actually just overlaying their own thing because they're being forced to al almost by the regulators and their reserve requirements that are going. The last point I'd make on the Texas recovery, and we've got to watch this very closely. It hasn't started yet, but it's coming. Uh, obviously tax revenues, state level and the local level, the county level, the school district, tax revenues are going to be hit really hard. Uh, schools maybe not quite as bad in the sense that property taxes don't go down as much, but the state isn't going to have the kind of money to help the school districts like they've had in the past. Uh, city and county, which relies more on sales taxes, uh, the state, which relies a good deal on oil uh, extraction tax, vehicle motor tax, and that kind of thing, uh, those revenues are down, and we're going to start seeing at some point in time uh, where local governments are going to have to, you know, tighten the belt, and, and we'll, we may see some round of uh, layoffs, cutback in services, and so forth, and unless uh, the local governments can get uh, find revenue sources or find uh, uh, ways to do it. It'll be interesting to see, quite frankly, I've, I've not heard it mentioned much in the, in the press, uh, but we do have at the state level something called a rainy day fund, and by God, it looks like to me it's pouring, but I, we'll have to see how, how, they, how they treat it and uh, if, if they even tap into it at all. Let me talk about housing just a little bit. We're going to run out of time here. Uh, here's, here's 2019. You don't really need to see all this. You all know 2019 was a really good year. The purple numbers over there, those were our original projections back in January and February, what we thought 2020 was going to look like this is before uh, the germ uh, or the virus uh, started hitting us all and found out. Here's, the, here's a summary of the March data around the state, and I've got this labeled. It's the last of the good months of housing. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to look this good again, and this doesn't look all that great. I'm just saying this, that March was going to be the last of the good months. When we get April and we get May in particularly, and maybe even into June, 
uh, I'll be very surprised. These are year over year percentage changes. So Texas up about 1.4%. You'll see the prices were up nearly five and a half to 6%. Uh, Dallas was flat in terms of sales. Uh, prices were up about three and a half percent. Houston, uh, Houston was more active. Austin, you can see was the, the sales pace is slowed down and even San Antonio. What I'd point, point out to you, the active listings, it was already starting in March. Statewide active listings, people were, were, were uh, taking houses off the market, weren't actively adding their house to the market, uh, down 8%. Dallas-Fort Worth down 17%. And, and what it does is it tightens up this market, this MOI, that's the months of inventory that, that we report on a regular basis. That's extremely tight. It basically says you don't have any inventory when you're down that low. But notice also at the same time, sales were pretty flat. What this, the month's inventory fell because the active listing count uh, fell dramatically. And I am, I'm going to expect that it's going to continue to fall here for the next couple of three months. People are just sort of, they're going to hold back and, and, and decide not to do it, despite the fact that, that if they can find a buyer and, and uh, so forth, I know that uh, you guys here in the title business, uh, you can handle remote uh, uh, online uh, notifications and notarization, and, and, and Texas is a RON state, uh, uh, and we have remote the capability and the, the process to do remote closings. And even, I've even heard that uh, many, uh, many companies are still doing uh, in-office closings because it's still, you, you can do it and limit it to less than 10 people. In fact, you can probably limit it to just three or four people and everybody can sit at least six feet apart there at the big closing table and, and get the deals done. So uh, it's, it's a, more of a psychological thing. And I, 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 I'm not a psychologist, but I can tell you that for the next three or four, five, six months, the, the consumer psychology, the business psychology, the economic psychology uh, is going to play as big or bigger role than anything else uh, going on in, in the marketplace today. Provide, a Fed is providing some liquidity. They're buying the, buying the mortgage-backed securities from Fannie Mae, uh, uh, Jenny Mae, so on. We've got about 4 million plus home uh, borrowers that are in forbearance so far. About 10% of the FHA loans, about 6 7% uh, of the Freddie Mac Fannie Mae loans. Um, we're just going to have to have to see. One of the things I'm going to tell you is that I, we're, we're real nervous about how forbearance is going to lead into foreclosures. Doesn't look like it'll be as bad as we had back in 08, 09 because we, we didn't have a, a lot of funny money in the market. It, it's really going to depend on how uh, the values go. Uh, National Multifamily Housing Co uh, uh, Council uh, reports that about 89% of the multifamily tenancy apartment made a full or partial April rent payment, which was only about 4% off norm. It, it, normally it's about a 92%, 91%, 93% um, uh, payment rate. Uh, through the first 10 days of the month. So, you know, it actually the apartment markets didn't get hit nearly as hard as a lot of people thought that they might. Early reports show that uh, retail, though, the malls and so forth, have only collected about 10 to 25% of the rent. This is what we're talking about, all of the shutdowns of the businesses. And of course, it'll have an effect. I, I gave you the housing starts and home sales. Uh, you can see that the home builders uh, optimism become kind of like the consumer uh, confidence in the index uh, fell off the cliff. It's down considerably. The housing starts, it, that's a lag effect. So we won't see that the housing starts, that orange line turn negative uh, here for probably another month or so. Uh, and, and we'll have to see, it'll be April and May, we'll, we'll turn, that'll turn around. Uh, it's interesting that, that on some of the, again, like the consumer survey for the home builders, their expectations though for six months and, and, and a year out are a whole lot better than what they are. This is a current, uh, what their current feeling is, uh, but their future is a whole lot better, uh, of course, than what their current. Thing. Mortgage refis are up. I mentioned all of this, the applications for new, new loans are down about 26%. This was these are, these are old numbers already, and even though they're only about two weeks old, 
but we're having to see homes are being the this listed uh, the credit overlays by the lenders here's a biggie uh, getting appraisals and inspections are limiting transactions uh uh, you can imagine it's very difficult for an inspector to go and inspect the property if the property owner doesn't want to let him in the front door and the inspector doesn't want to go through the front door so it's kind of hard to get them done uh, they're still happening uh, in fact i i was talking to uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, heads of the board of realtors at another in another area of the state from you guys uh, who who said they have a real problem because they had an inspector who went into a house and did the inspection and come to find out his wife was a nurse and she had at least been exposed to somebody who had the virus. His wife didn't necessarily have the virus, just that she was a nurse at the hospital and got exposed. So they're all up and up in arms about that. Appraisers, the same thing. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Jenny Mae have said that they'll accept a 120 day deferral on appraisals. But the lenders don't like that idea because they don't want it to come back 120 days from now and discover property values have gone down. And all of a sudden that 80% loan they thought they were making is now 110% loan. So that's going to be a, that's going to be a problem. And the loans that are greater than an 80% that need PMI will, without an inspection is going to be real difficult to get the private mortgage insurance companies to, to issue the PMIs. We're seeing uh, owners are increasingly halting projects and scheduling uh, and canceling scheduled starts. That was on the building side. Uh, we are beginning to hear about some shortages of materials and, and, and workers, but materials. I think about it, we, we import, uh, I think on the average new home being built, the, the percentage I've seen is between 15 to 20% of the, the products that go into the building of the house come from China. LED lighting and things of that say, uh, nature. Uh, even the personal protection equipment uh, uh, that the the builders, the the mask for the painters and the builders and the and the drywall uh, uh, installers and so forth. So that's a that's an issue. Uh, and and a lot of them. The the biggest issue here might not be just the shortage of these materials, but how long it takes to get them and cancel deliveries. So timing and delivery becomes a cost. And then of course, layoffs are becoming a little more widespread and we're seeing that uh, the MBA, the Mortgage Bankers Association releases a uh, index of mortgage credit availability. And this is what I'm talking about. The lenders are simply making mortgage credit available less and less uh, here in the, in the last two weeks. And we're anticipating that for the next 30 to 45, 60 days, that, that graph will probably continue to go down some more uh, as lenders make home financing and home loans more difficult. Uh, this one is also a little dated. This is the forbearance, uh, the number of loans in forbearance. Uh, and you can see how it, uh, this is the, uh, going on. Uh, Jenny and Fannie are, are down. Jenny is the highest one. That's the FHA loans. Those were, those were a little bit uh, more risky loans generally to lower uh, lower income borrowers, some with much lower uh, FICA scores to begin with. Uh, so not surprisingly that they have forbearance. The forbearance into foreclosures, that's a big question mark. I don't know. Uh, it, when we had the Great Recession, 08, 09, we had nearly 12 million foreclosures nationwide. I don't think, I don't anticipate it's going to be that bad, but it still remains if if people can get back to their jobs and get back on payroll and start making their payments, I think the foreclosure is a four month right now. It's a four month program, debatable if it'll be extended. Uh, lenders and and the and the financial institutions that hold the mortgages, the bondholders are not going to want to have for forbearance go uh, that far out. As most of you know. The mortgage servicers just recently were given a four month limit on what their obligations are in order to make up the P&I payments uh, through to the bondholders. Even that is going to be tough for many of these servicers. They may not have the credit resource or the capital resources uh, to do that. The low interest rates will stimulate demand back into the housing market and so forth, but only if the jobs come back. I mean, that's just, it's going to be really, really critical for the jobs to come back to fuel everything else. Construction brokerage 
sales practices. My guess that your business, the title business, is adapting to new technology and processes. And and quite honestly, none of it, it may never go back to the way it was. So all of us of, of age, and you can see the color of my hair, we always like to talk about the good old days and how it used to be and what we used to do. It's all going to be meaningless because what we're going to be doing a year from now and two years from now uh, and the way we buy and sell houses and the way we close the deals and the way we do the, the lending and so forth, uh, it, it may be a whole new ball game uh, within the next, uh, next few months, uh, but particularly over the next year or two. As I've said before, home construction could be a prime recovery activity. It, it's not only a maybe, it really needs to be. Uh, every recession we've ever had, a little the Great Recession, housing was first in and first out and helped bring up the entire economy. We have that ability this time because the, we didn't have a fundamental economic problem. This was all health related. It was all uh, a, an epidemic, a pandemic that created the slowdown. The, if the jobs are recreated, if incomes are recreated, uh, we can't we back to the level of home demand that would lead to more construction and more housing activity. And remember, we went into all of this, we were still woefully short. Supply was short in the first place. So we really still need to catch up even more. And I leave you with the thought, people still have to live somewhere. Occupancy rates are going to maintain. Rent payments are going to pay. People, you're either going to be a renter or a buyer. Or you're going to live underneath the bridge somewhere, and and away you go. So, I appreciate the opportunity. We've been on about an hour. That was what we planned on. Angie, I still can't hear anybody. Uh, I have seen some questions or some other some comments flashing across my screen screen from time to time, but uh, I'll try and answer whatever I can. Jim? Oh, I actually hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes, okay. So I finally got it to work. And I know we have a little bit of time for some questions. So does anyone have any questions? Because uh, Mr. Gaines does have to get off the line at 2.30. I got to do this again. Yes. <laughs> I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing any uh, questions in here. Are you seeing any questions? I've seen a couple of comments go by, and I do appreciate. Thank you very much. What do you know about? Uh, I, I didn't care. Yes, I Yes, I'm not seeing any questions though. Okay, well, this will be record. This has been recorded, so I do. We do have a copy of it. And um, do you want to give a shout out for your email, Jim? If anyone maybe wanted to email you sometime. Uh, you could, uh, Sean, I do see something, uh, somebody, Texas Affordable Housing Grants. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know that uh, uh, the affordability grants, of course, made from, to, from the feds to the state and then allocated out to the individual. I haven't talked to anybody over at TSACH lately. I know Dave and some of the people over there. I, I know they're real concerned about it. Uh, and, and the honest answer is, I don't know. I do know, for example, I talked to uh, one housing authority uh, person uh, here just yesterday that they had gotten a, a private grant uh, that had been pledged to them and they were getting all set to, to uh, start out building a new uh, um, affordable housing project. I think it was going to have 65 units or so. And yesterday they got the word that the grant was pulled because everybody's nervous where the money's come from. Uh, okay, I didn't, it flashed, the, your notes are flashing up and by the time I see them, they flash off and I don't get to put them up. Okay, so here, did you see the other one? Can you estimate when if major oil and gas layoffs will happen and what is the number of PP? The, the layoffs have already started. They actually started several months ago. Uh, best guess, uh, it, it, in terms of sheer number, it won't, it won't be that overwhelming because there, there's not that many people that work now in that industry segment 
uh, that are going to get counted, not like the uh, leisure and hospitality and some of the business services and some of the others, but it, it has already started uh, and it's probably going to be quite significant uh, because they don't see a short term solution where they're going to try to hang on to people uh, and protect the jobs for the prices to come back. I do, I will tell you though, the feeling out in the Permian, uh, when I talked to the people out in Odessa yesterday, uh, their general feel out there is that prices are gonna go back to $30, $40 a barrel uh, within the next couple of three months. So if they're right, uh, we may see the loss of jobs there on the oil and gas sector uh, level out. I, I saw a couple of others flashed by me, but I didn't. One, one was also is uh, your thoughts on the appraisal moving forward in the next few months that are pulling statistics from time we are in the shelter place. And that's, you know, the, the appraisers are, are in a real dilemma right now. They, they're having the dilemma just physically, can I go and visit the house or, or examine the property and so forth. But also, as you all know, appraisers and appraisal, the appraisal process is a historical process. You have to have the comparable sales. Uh, you have to have history, uh, even if it's recent, even if it's just last week or last month, but you got to have it. And, and the, the activity level has been so low here lately. Uh, I don't know if these are picking up that activity. Also, the closings that are happening today, as you guys well know, are based on contracts that were signed 30, 60, 70 days ago. Uh, before a lot of this hit. Uh, so those prices, it'll be interesting to see if they maintain. And the appraisers, the ones that I've talked to, are extremely nervous about doing an appraisal right now because they don't know how much or what kind of value adjustment to make, if any, uh, because of the uh, uh, effects here of the shutdown. So I'm glad I'm not an appraiser. Yes. I think, uh, Dr. Gaines, that was the last question I saw. So thank you very much, and thank you all for joining. We will have a copy of this for you that attended today. And just keep Allegiance title in mind as you're writing those contracts. We have over 20 offices in the Metroplex and offices in the Houston area as well. So thank you, Dr. Gaines. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Here come everybody. I'm sitting. Yeah. <laughs>